Uh, now this was Fawcett's understanding. Of it. I don't know this is that one person. I'd love to get my hands on the Yeah. Yeah, thank you. I appreciate it. Your nice talking to you, Sai. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, I'm, I'm going to introduce her. Hey, who's going to introduce you? Oh, okay. okay. Okay, great. Yeah. It's your Jorge? Yes. Welcome, everyone. Say thanks to. Uh, Thanks to my uh, Susquehannock alum politics class uh, for sharing their uh, class with uh, the university. Um, the microphone, I know you're looking at, is for the cameras uh, alone. Um, a couple of other thank yous uh, to the Jack Miller Center uh, uh, for you know, their helping us bring today's speaker. Um, as most of you know, we have a tradition in the program that we have one of our undergraduate uh, fellows uh, introduce our speaker. Uh, Jorge Plaza, who's a member of the class and a Tocqueville fellow, will introduce Professor Mabry. Go ahead. Thank you, Professor Munoz. Good afternoon, everyone. I am greatly honored to introduce our distinguished speaker, Professor Forrest Neighbors. A self-proclaimed mugwump, <laughs> Professor Neighbors received his BA from the University of Chicago for political science and classics. Later on, he received his master's and PhD in political science from the University of Oregon. Professor Neighbors taught American government and political philosophy at the University of Oregon and Oregon State University before joining the Department of Political Science at the University of Alaska at Anchorage, where he now serves as an associate professor and chair. His current research focuses on the changing nature of American politics leading up to the Civil War and Reconstruction. Prior to receiving his doctorate at the University of Oregon, Professor Neighbors worked as a high technology business executive and he remains actively involved in economic and civic development projects for his community. In 2017, Professor Neighbors published his first book titled From Oligarchy to Republicanism, The Great Task of Reconstruction. The book received the American Political Thought Book Award for Best Book from the American Political Science Association. Now without further ado, I present to you Dr. Forrest Neighbors. Thank you very much, Jorge. Thank you, Jorge, and uh, thank you, Professor Munoz, and uh, to the Constitutional Studies Program, the Jack Miller Center, and I also want to give a shout out to Alaska Airlines, who generously supports uh, scholars coming from Alaska to the lower 48, as we say, and, uh, and they were very kind in supporting my visit here today. Um, <clears throat> I'm just going to jump right into it. Uh, what was Reconstruction? Um, you probably have an opinion about what Reconstruction was. Uh, the common opinion among scholars and the American people, probably since the mid-20th century until now, is that it was a period when the equal citizenship of black Americans was at stake, especially in the American South, right? That happens after the American Civil War. And that the goal of the Republican Congress, who are the managers of Reconstruction policy, <clears throat> was to expand citizenship, create biracial democracy from white democracy. The premise of that belief is that before and after Reconstruction, the United States was a democracy. And I maintain that the attempt to establish equal citizenship for black Americans constituted part of a larger task. So um, I learned from Plato that um, when we, we demonstrate our understanding of a thing, if we can say what that thing is, and so I'm going to tell you what I think Reconstruction was, and I'm going to use precise language. I've even written it down, despite the fact that I wrote a book about this. Uh, <clears throat> my claim is that Reconstruction was a period when the government of the United States attempted to reestablish the American Republic on the restored principles of the American founding. The premise of my claim is that the United States was not a uniform democracy, 
long before secession began in 1860, the United States had become a divided nation between republicanism concentrated in the North and oligarchy concentrated in the American South. By republicanism, I mean rule of the people by natural right. By oligarchy, I mean rule of the few for their own advantage. During the antebellum period, the growing divide between these two sections produced inter-regime conflict, which culminated in inter-regime war, our American Civil War. And the refounding of the American Republic required regime change in the South from oligarchy to republicanism. So the Civil War Reconstruction period, in my formulation, was a revolutionary period in the sense that the fundamental form of the American political regime was in doubt, pitting oligarchic revolutionaries against republican counter-revolutionaries. Southern oligarchy um, was revolutionary. The oligarchy sought to replace the republicanism of the American founders. The Republican Party was counter-revolutionary. They attempted to defeat the oligarchic revolution and reestablish the founders' republicanism. Now, by my reckoning, Reconstruction is one of three revolutionary periods. The Civil War Reconstruction period is one of three revolutionary periods. And as such, the attempted revolution and the necessary counter-revolution have deep roots connected to the last revolutionary period, that is, the founding. Um, so what I'm going to do now is talk about the origin of this challenge to the American political regime and the justification for counter-revolution and reconstruction. And I'll begin, I decided to begin with a uh, quotation from a great uh, member of the United States House of Representatives from the great state of, of Indiana, Schuyler Colfax. He was elected Speaker of the House in December of 1865. After the end of the Civil War, Appomattox was in April, the surrender of the Confederacy to uh, the United States government. Lincoln had been shot. The first Congress that convened after the end of the American Civil War was that December. And when Schuyler Colfax was elected Speaker of the House, he charged the Congress to execute a dormant mandate in the Constitution that the Republic had previously failed to execute. I'm going to tell you what that is. Speaking of the duty of Congress, Colfax says this, its first and highest obligation is to guarantee to every state a Republican form of government, end quote. And he goes on to equate Republican government with the chief object of government in the Declaration of Independence, which is protection to all men in their inalienable rights, and then goes on to tell Congress that they must establish Republican government anew in the rebel states. So there you see a recognition at the very beginning of the next Congress when the war is over that what the Congress must do next is to establish Republican government in the states. And for many pages after in the proceedings of Congress after that speech, you can see in these debates that they're already talking about how they were, they're going to go about doing this. Colfax was referring in, uh, in that speech to Article 4, Section 4 of the Constitution, which says that the United States shall guarantee to every state in this union a Republican form of government. It's the only place in the Constitution where a form of government is even mentioned in, in the Constitution, which raises the question, why was it included in the Constitution to begin with? A good answer can be found in Federalist 43, which was written by James Madison. I've, I've scanned your syllabus. I do not believe it's on your list of Federalist essays, 
but uh, so this might not, but you, you have many other very good Federalist essays assigned <laughs> to you. So um, next, uh, next, yeah, when you next class. Um, but here's what Madison says about the Guarantee Clause. He says this, quote, in a confederacy founded on Republican principles and composed of Republican members, the superintending government ought to clearly to possess authority to defend the system against aristocratic and monarchical innovations. The more intimate the nat nature of such a union may be, the greater interest have the members in the political institutions of each other and the greater right to insist that the forms of government under which the compact was entered into should be substantially maintained. All right. What he means there is that if we are going to form a country, and let's say there are multiple states uh, that we compose in this room, all of, and we, are, we want to form, we want to, uh, to maintain republican government, that is rule of the people by natural right, then all of us should be concerned that maintains a Republican form of government. Because if one of us, let's say a state over here, becomes aristocratically governed, that uh, infection could spread to the rest of the body. And the closer our union is, the more susceptible we are to infection from that one state, or maybe it's two, maybe it's three, maybe it's 15, which was the case in 1860, right? 15 states did not have Republican forms of government. Um, they were oligarchies. Well, uh, so Madison wanted to, he explains that he, we need to ensure a, a Republican uniformity but then he hedges a little bit. Slightly uh, down in that explanation of Federalist 43, he says this. The only restriction imposed on them, that is the states, is that they shall not exchange Republican for anti-Republican constitutions. Okay? Um, that is a sleight of hand. He moves from talking about the forms the actual forms of government of the components of the union to talking about their constitutions. And forms of government and written constitutions are not always the same thing. Uh, take, for example, the Soviet Constitution and the actual government of the Soviet Union. If you read the Constitution of the Soviet Union, it looks pretty good. Uh, but in practice, it doesn't seem to resemble what you find in the written constitution. Or to take another example, you could have the exact same constitutions with, say, property qualifications for voting. Let's say the property qualification is that you must have a, your, your personal estate must have a net value of $10,000. In, an, in a fairly prosperous state, that doesn't disenfranchise anybody. Uh, let's say 90% can vote. You take the exact same constitution with the exact same property qualification and you put it on a poor state, and what do you get? You get maybe 80% disenfranchised. So in the first case, the exact same constitution but different conditions you get majority rule. In the second case, you get uh, rule of the few, right? So conditions really matter. Forms, the actual forms of government are the result of written constitutions plus the conditions. You can't know what an actual government is unless you know for sure, in, unless you also know what the conditions are. And we know this. Now, Bear with me, because this is going to help you understand Reconstruction. Um, we also know that Madison knew that um, Republican constitutions don't guarantee a Republican form of government. In a private note that he wrote in, in the 1790s, he admits 
that Southern governments are not Republican despite their Republican constitutions. So he knew this. And this is his private note that was discovered after his death. He wrote, in proportion as slavery prevails in a state, the government, however democratic in name, must be aristocratic in fact. Notice that he uses the word must be, must. It is a necessary consequence of the existence of slavery. He goes on to say that the southern states of America are on the same principle aristocracies, rule of the few. Okay. And he says that in Virginia that, that political power is held by roughly a quarter of the whole overall population. So um, what we are encountering is the anti-Republican effect of slavery. The founders knew this. Okay. Madison is not the only one to recognize that. Many do. So they were, when, if, when you uncover writings from the founders when they're, when they're speaking about slavery, you will come across denunciations. But keep your eyes open not only for their denunciations on moral grounds, but also because the effect of chattel slavery the, on, on government was pernicious, and that slavery, to the extent that in proportion, uh, as uh, it's, uh, to the extent that slavery expanded and grew, it, its proportionate effect uh, on Republican government, pernicious, pernicious effect on Republican government, uh, was extenuated. So the ultimate extinction of slavery was necessary to successfully establish Republicanism. <laughs> And the founders knew this from the very beginning. I want to illustrate how that happens. So I'm going to divide the class into thirds. Okay? So let's make the dividing points here and here. Okay? And what is your name, Miss? Aaron. Aaron. Okay, Aaron, you, uh, I, pardon me, but I, I'm going to have to make you a slaveholder. And everybody else in this third of the room, room are, are slaves. Okay, and you're a slave holder. And your name, sir? Jack. Jack, same thing. Jack and Aaron are slaveholders in, the, in these two thirds of the room. And over here, Professor Barber is the elected representative from this third of the room. These are electoral districts in a state. Let's call this the state of South Carolina. Okay? And in the state of South Carolina, these are. Uh, Aaron, is, is uh, you come to the assembly, the, the House of Representatives of the state of South Carolina, and Jack, so do you, and so does Professor Barber. Okay? Now, everybody in this third of the room is free. Okay? Non-slaveholders, you're all free. Two slaveholders, they come to the assembly. Who wins on every political question that comes up before that assembly? They do, despite the fact that they have a majority of the, they have, their uh, 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 population is entirely free, um, they're perpetual losers on every political question that comes before the assembly. So for example, uh, Professor Barber's constituents want to set up a uh, free school system like that which exists in New England. He presents a bill on the floor of the South Carolina House of Representatives, and they say, no, we don't want that. And in fact, they propose their own bill, which taxes them, and all of the money is put into private academies and colleges that their children attend. So they don't have a, a school system. And that's exactly what happened in the American South when they proposed legislation to, uh, say, fund branches of railroads. They would have those railroad lines come right into the Black Belt where their plantations were. It would be funded by the common treasury, which their taxes paid, and that would benefit them. And when they tried to uh, argue for having a branch of the railroad serve their part of the state, 
they would get voted down. Or here's another example. That's an actual example from the state of Georgia. Here's one from the state of Virginia. In Virginia, um, they, exempt, they uh, ex exempted slaves under a certain age from taxation, but they taxed them. They used the tax money to pay for slave patrols, but they didn't own slaves. So why should they pay, right? So they were using the treasury, which they funded, to benefit them. That is the definition of oligarchy, rule of the few to the advantage of the few. And that's the effect of slavery, because in the apportion, in apportionment of these legislative districts, in the slave states, in many of those slave states, their constitutions counted slaves. You take the whole population, you divide it by um, into legislative districts with the same numbers of human beings in them, and then you uh, have a representative from each of those districts. Well, they're slave-heavy heavy districts, which means that for every extra slave they have, they get additional bonus points right? in, political, in pol terms of political power. That's how slavery was not only the basis of the economic system in the South, but also the basis of their political power. That's how chattel slavery translates into oligarchy. And it doesn't matter what your state constitution says, the effect is the same. And it was the same in every state that, uh, where slavery uh, grew and developed. The founders already knew that this was the effect. And so what they did um, was they tried to use the national government to facilitate the ultimate abolition of slavery nationally. Um, but let me talk a little bit about the condition of the American states uh, at the time of the American founding. First of all, slavery was legal everywhere. It, uh, the British Empire had um, forbade the abolition of slavery and forbade the restriction, restrictions on the slave trade. So even though the colonies pro had protested against the continuance of the slave trade, the British government overruled them and just kept the slaves coming in. So when the last stroke of, of the last quill on the Declaration of Independence was finished, every state of the United States was a slave state. So the founders had a lot of work to do if they wanted to establish and preserve a republic. The states from north to south began abolition. And they got down to the line uh, with Maryland. Um, they abolished, they prohibited slavery in the, in the Northwest Territories, the territories that became the future states of Indiana, Illinois, Michigan, uh, Wisconsin, parts of Minnesota, and Ohio. That's a pretty big territory and was about the same in terms of square miles or close to it as the eastern seaboard states. So you abolish slavery from New Hampshire down to Maryland. You prohibit it in the Northwest Territories. And they um, prohibited the slave trade on January 1st, 1808. So there's no more slaves coming into the Union. Now you've got it cornered in that southeastern area. Right? And they passed laws in, in Maryland and Virginia to make the manumission of slaves um, easier. Right? And indeed, by 1800, there were 100,000 free black Americans in the, upper, uh, in the upper south as a result of, of those policies. So they were trying to um, abolish slavery. Now, New England was probably the only place. Let me just talk a little bit about the political, the, the dissimilar political character of the states. The New England states is really. I consider the home of American republicanism. That's where it started. It grew from there. Um, their way of life, their principles were solidly Republican. Right? The home of John Adams. That's where American republicanism uh, had its origin. Um, the mid-Atlantic states, they were structurally 
aristocratic, rule of the few. Um, but a majority of the statesmen there, even though they were, uh, they had aristocratic power, um, they were Republicans by conviction. And a good example of this is, um, well, Im immediately after American independence in 1776, Virginia uh, began to, their legislature begins to try to reform their institutions. They end entail and primogeniture. They, they try to, um, um, they, they restrict slavery. They pass manumission laws. In the United States Congress, uh, in the first Congress, when an, an abolition bill is presented uh, by Benjamin Franklin as head of the uh, uh, Pennsylvania Anti-Slavery Society, Virginia delegation votes, I believe the number was five to two, might have been seven to two, I think it was five, uh, in favor of consideration, even though the state of Virginia had uh, roughly 40% of all of the slaves in the United States. Right? And so Virginia's representatives were for republicanism. They were uh, in favor of abolition. They were Republicans by conviction. You know of the famous Virginia founders and their, um, you know, and, and their convictions, uh, Republican convictions, Madison, Jefferson, Patrick Henry, George Mason, Washington, Je you know, so on. All on down the line. Georgia and South Carolina, structurally aristocratic like Virginia, you know, oligarchic, rule of the few, but uh, you don't see any movement there towards abolition or towards uh, reforming their political ins institutions and making them more Republican. Right? They are determined to remain as they were which raises the question, why did they join the American Union to begin with? Um, and my, the best answer I can come up with in my research is just reasons of state. Right? It suited their interests. Um, but they repudiate the uh, doctrine of natural rights from the very beginning. Um, and, uh, and never really are comfortably embrace those ideas. Um, nevertheless, so in that environment, it looks like you know, the anti-slavery movement, it might win because of what they achieved and because of the abolitionist intentions of the, the mid-Atlantic, you know, the southern um, founders and statesmen. Uh, eventually, Georgia and South Carolina, you could foresee from that point, will probably get isolated and they will be forced to abolish slavery uh, by the rest of, of the other states. Um, reform is ongoing during, during the early national period, the founding and early national period. Um, but then something changes. The generation that are um, the grandsons of the, of the founding generation, they change. They, they change. Um, the, Virginia, North Carolina, they begin to embrace oligarchy. They begin to embrace uh, the, the positive good of slavery argument. And um, so reform stops. And um, now, while reform is ongoing, it made no sense for the national government to invoke Article 4, Section 4, right? Remember that clause? The guarantee of republicanism in every state of the union, it doesn't really make sense to try to marshal national power to force republican on the states that were already reforming because they were doing it on their own. And so why risks conflict between the national government and the states if they're doing it by themselves? But as soon as you see uh, southern statesmen begin to change their point of view and argue for slavery and begin to argue for its positive good and argue and call the self, the, the, the uh, Declaration of Independence a pack of self-evident lies, uh, then it becomes difficult to invoke Article 4, Section 4 because those same people who are denouncing the Declaration of Independence and praising slavery are part of the national government. 
So how can you get the national government to reach its arm into the offending state and force republicanism on them? Um, so you, you see the paradox. So the Article 4, Section 4 is never used. And Southern oligarchy, it develops and spreads. And it's um, one of its, its chief uh, statesmen is John C. Calhoun from South Carolina, who invented new constitutional doctrines that justified, that protected oligarchy. The, the whole idea of state sovereignty was interposed against the, the idea of, of uh, 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 well, against Article 4, Section 4, to try to protect those southern oligarchies against possible um, governmental federal power. Uh, and uh, that becomes a real issue during the nullification crisis uh, and when Andrew Jackson is president. He was going to invoke Article 4, Section 4 and lead an army down to South Carolina, which was um, uh, at that time threatening to secede from the Union. Um, but a compromise was reached. And uh, after the nullification crisis passed, the oligarchic, uh, the interstate oligarchy all over the South begins to uh, spread even further. So, um, the fight over the territories. When slavery breaks out of its southeastern corner and begins spreading west, now the, really the, the soul of the Union is in danger because everywhere slavery spreads, you can expect a new oligarchic class to rise up, join the existing interstate ruling oligarchy, and strengthen uh, the, the, that system against American republicanism. So when you read about the fight over the territories in the West, for example, after, uh, during the Missouri crisis or after the Mexican War, um, the fight over the slave or free status of those territories is really a proxy for the conf this inter-regime conflict between republicanism and oligarchy. That's why the fight becomes so bitter. Because if every one of these new territories that comes in can come in as a slave state uh, uh, eventually, uh, then the slave states outnumber the free states. And then you could alter the United States Constitution. You could get three quarters of the states, make put slavery into the Constitution, which had not been explicitly mentioned. And you could basically turn the United States Constitution into something that looks like the Confederate Constitution of 1861, where slavery is mentioned 15, 20 times, right? And, and, uh, giving, and giving explicit protection to slave owning. So uh, after the Mexican War, uh, the United States acquires territory that doubles its land mass. And the freer slave status of all of that territory is in doubt. Right? And by that time, after the, the, the um, war with Mexico ends in 1848, um, southern oligarchy has really matured. And now, uh, from 1848, um, well, really, uh, uh, you know, the, the fight leading up to the 1850 compromise is very bitter, and everybody knows what the stakes are. And it's in, during those debates, the first time that a northern statesman says publicly on the floor of the United States Congress, uses that word, oligarchy, uh, and accuses the South of trying to uh, overthrow American republicanism. Um, so it becomes very, uh, very bitter. Um, the 1850s, the decade of the 1850s uh, uh, begins rather gently, but then the peace, you know, after the compromise of 1850, but then 1854 comes. And hopefully I've noticed you have some readings from the Lincoln-Douglas debates uh, where the uh, Kansas-Nebraska Act is, is, um, is discussed. That act in 1854 is what blows up the parties and really is, is uh, 
leads us into civil war. Um, in 1854, Stephen Douglas proposes legislation that will turn the, dis the decision of whether the, the territories should be free or slave to the people in those territories. This is his doctrine, his definition of popular sovereignty, um, which he gets from Lewis Cass of, of Michigan. Um, and that means that now all of these territories are in play. The Missouri Compromise Line, as, as you might know, north of the Missouri Compromise Line, slavery had always been forbidden as part of the, 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 um, the settlement in, 18, in 1820 and 1821. But after the Kansas-Nebraska Act is passed, um, all of that territory is now, um, is now uh, uh, subject to, or, you know, to the uh, popular sovereignty. So this gives the oligarchy a chance to grab more territory and grab more states, right? So um, that exacerbates the tension. Um, the Whig Party instantly dissolves free state statesmen who had been members of the Whig Party and, and uh, Dem Northern Democrats who can no longer go along with uh, the Democratic program. They form the Republican Party. And if you look at, here's something that scholars have not, I think, adequately, um, our, our histories of the Republican Party, I think, do the founding of the, of the party injustice. They really should um, clarify that the, the purpose of the party, as the party leaders say, was to save American republicanism from this growing oligarchic threat. It's explicit in the first uh, platforms of the, the uh, first state uh, chapters of the Republican Party. It's in the, the Michigan uh, Republican Party platform. It says that we will, we renounce our former affiliations to other parties and will come together uh, to save American republicanism against the most revolting aristocracy that is ever, you know, we've ever seen on earth, right? And other state parties use similar language. Um, the founders of, the, of, those, of those state chapters say the same thing. Um, so really you should look at the founding of the Republican Party as a reaction to the Kansas-Nebraska Act, which gave oligarchy a new opportunity to expand its power and dominate the American, and replace American republicanism as our form of government. So the Republican Party, it, it, uh, it really is a uh, melange of former, uh, you know, of, of party men who belong to lots of different parties and movements. There were people who were pro-tariff, anti-tariff, people who, had, who were for federalists, and you know, people who believed in states. They all just dropped their, their policy differences for a higher purpose, which was to save our, uh, to save American republicanism. That's how the, uh, the Republican Party begins, and that's why they chose the name that they chose. And in their first national platform, they begin saying that um, with our Republican fathers, we too believe in these self-evident truths that all men are created equal, um, you know, et, et cetera, uh, restating the principles of the Declaration of Independence. So that's how the Republican Party starts. And um, in the South, uh, the uh, Southern oligarchy, this is something that you know, Americans don't really know. They had expansionist ambitions. Their goal was to either take over the Union or uh, to break away from it and to move South. They had expansionist plans in mind, and they're ex this is on the historical record, too. Uh, one senator from Alabama says that uh, he wants the Caribbean, he wants Mexico, he wants to keep moving down and through Central America and expanding all of that land. Right? A new debate breaks out in South Carolina about whether or not they should de defy federal statute and reopen the slave trade. Right? In the Confederate uh, Constitutional, in, or the, in the Confederate Convention, 
um, one uh, confederate, one delegate to that convention, a man by the name of Leonidas Spratt, wants to open the slave trade, and he says that in the existing limits of the proposed confederacy, they can hold 40 million more slaves. 40 million more. At that time in the United States, there were three and a half million. And the whole population of the United States, I think in the 1860 census, was, I want to say, 28 million? I think it was 28 or 30. I forget. Um, but uh, they wanted to add, he wanted to add 40 million, import 40 million more slaves from Africa and spread them out across the uh, American South. And then they wanted to continue to expand, right? I mean, just imagine that. They would, and, and then sort of co-opt the, uh, the Mexican aristocracy into their ruling class, right? I mean, if that had succeeded, uh, you could just imagine that some future European tyrant would have found a ready ally right in the American hemisphere. So when the war breaks out, um, after Lincoln is elected, Lincoln's uh, platform, the platform of his policy is very moderate one, it's just no more slave territories, no more slave states, right? Um, they wanted the, uh, uh, they wanted to stop expansion, allow the slave states to keep slavery where it already exists, but the new states that come in have to be free, right? That was his platform and that was too much for the southern states, so they secede, form the Confederacy, and start the war uh, against the Union. Now, think about this, just so we understand the scope of the achievement of the Republicans at this time. Really, the last redoubt for Republicanism in the world was a small bit of land from Maine to uh, Minnesota, from Canada to the Ohio River, throw in uh, Kansas, Oregon, and California, and that's it. That's all there was left. Right? Um, France had a new Napoleon on the throne. The Republican Revolution in Europe in 1848 had been crushed by, uh, uh, on the continent. Right? Prussia had crushed the German revolutionaries. Um, aristocracy was resurgent in England. France was building an international, Napoleon III was trying to build an international empire. He had put a Habsburg on the throne of Mexico. And now you have this new powerful confederacy in the American South that was a ready ally, an obvious ally uh, for them. Britain and France almost came, at, well, Britain in particular, almost came into our war on the side of the Confederacy twice. They had armies in Nova Scotia, right? And they were poised and ready to come in and help the Confederate states against the Union. The, the deck seemed stacked against, you know, Republican liberty in the world at that time. Um, but uh, they prevailed. And helping them in their victory were many poor white, non-slaving hold, holding whites, as well as former slaves from the southern slave states. This is something that few people know, which is that there were not only Union regiments composed of former slaves from the slave states, there were also Union regiments composed of Every one of white Union regiments composed of every one of the slave states except for uh, Georgia, which sent a battalion, and South Carolina. And the only reason why South Carolina didn't was because Jefferson Davis had the good sense to send an or army to the Greenville Spartanburg area when the war broke out. Um, to, that's where the non slaving section of, uh, of South Carolina is. So there were this idea that. Contemporary Americans have that this was South versus North is, you know, ought to be qualified. There were um, Southern, you know, part of the, the ruled class of the South filled out un Union uniforms, 
by, in hundreds, by the hundreds of thousands and fought against the, the, con, the Confederate Army. So that's what happened. Um, and let's move now to back to our friend, uh, Speaker of the House Colfax in 1865 when the war is over. Um, Colfax, in order to plant republicanism anew in the defeated southern states, he and Senate leadership, they put together the, um, the Reconstruction Committee, which is a, a, a joint committee uh, of uh, senators and congressmen from both houses, and they come up with a report. That report is very explicit. It says that uh, slavery built up this oligarchy. And though it's been defeated in war, it now needs to be uprooted um, from the American continent. And they're, they're, uh, the primary work product of that committee is a draft of the 14th Amendment. So the 14th Amendment has four sections. Uh, the first section of the 14th Amendment it uh, requires equal citizenship and equality before the law. And hopefully you've read that it says no state shall abridge the privileges and immunities of uh, United States citizenship. That's a paraphrase. Um, section 2 corrects this problem of malapportionment that I, that I just uh, demonstrated to you when I divided the class into thirds. What that says is that if any uh, class of uh, persons are uh, disenfranchised, right? That uh, that the the representation in the United States Congress shall be reduced proportionately. Right? So there's a remedy put in there so that Southerners don't get extra re representation in Congress if they disenfranchise uh, the emancipated. Right? Um, section three says that statesmen who serve the oligarchy, I'm paraphrasing, uh, cannot serve the United States government. So those who had served in the Confederacy after having served in federal office, they can't go back into federal office. And the intention behind that is to make sure that the former oligarchs don't come back. Right? And section four says that investors Again, I'm paraphrasing. Investors in the oligarchy, those who had funded the uh, Confederate government, they can't get paid back. Right? So there's financial punishment for those who had funded uh, the Southern oligarchy. So that the Fourteenth Amendment is is supposed to uh, is supposed to remedy uh, the situation and facilitate the establishment of of Republican government in the states. Now, my interpretation is that uh, the 14th Amendment is not constitutionally necessary. It wasn't constitutionally necessary. That, um, you know, the Guarantee Clause, Article 4, Section 4, means pretty much everything that uh, Sections 1 and 2 of the 14th Amendment specify. That is equal citizenship, you know, equality before the law. You can't rank citizen. You can't, you know, um, um, rank human beings uh, and call that Republican government, right? According to natural rights republicanism, uh, which is the form of, of American republicanism, you everybody has to be equal, right, before the law, and uh, so. Or Section four that guarantees Republican government in each state. I think in every state, uh, it really doesn't need the Fourteenth Amendment if we understand the intentions of the founding generation and their understanding of what Republican government was. But because, <coughs> but I, I do admit that the Fourteenth Amendment was politically necessary. It was politically necessary. Um, because uh, the, the old oligarchy had tried to reinterpret what republicanism was. And there, there was disagreement about the Constitution and how to interpret it. 
And so in order to remove that, uh, the, the possibility of disagreement, uh, the 14th Amendment was politically necessary to specify what Republican government is. All right, and sections one and two in particular uh, were necessary to specify the conditions that states had to meet in order to be considered Republican. So the 14th Amendment didn't really revolutionize the idea of Republican citizenship, but it was intended to be a revolution in the enforcement of Republicanism by specifying justiciable conditions of Republican citizenship. Right? Um, now let's, I, I want to open it up for questions, but I, I just very briefly want to uh, sort of talk about the verdict of Reconstruction. I mean, there was a problem with enforcement. Uh, and with Southern statesmen back in Congress, which they, they did come uh, when, they, when they were readmitted to Congress, the United States government was again enervated. It, it could not, um, you know, it could not enforce uh, the 14th Amendment for the same reasons that the Article 4, Section 4, the Guarantee Clause couldn't be reinforced because you had southern you had southern statesmen representing the states who needed uh, uh, re uh, um, to be remediated they were there in the government so how could you get the national government to reach its hand into its arm into the offending state and fix things when the very people who you need to uh, that you need to correct are part of the national government so that became a, a major problem. Uh, another major problem is that uh, the non-slaveholders who had fought for the Union against the Confederacy, the Southern non-slaveholding, uh, Southern non-slaveholders, they eschewed an alliance with the former slaves. So that Southern state government transformed from rule of the few over the many, uh, both white and black, towards rule of white over black. And that was the result. So uh, oligarchic ranks were partially compressed. Right? So, um, the, the, uh, uh, um, uh, so whereas before, uh, let me, I'll just repeat this, say this a different way. Before, uh, a few whites ruled over many whites and blacks after uh, re, uh, you know, the American Civil War, it became rule of white over black. And Jim Crow and segregation followed. So in my assessment of Reconstruction, I would say that um, its success, we, we don't really remember its success. Uh, that it Reconstruction, it really did stop the expansion of oligarchy. And it established the constitutional foundations for gradual Republican transformation. Right? So it, we didn't get civil rights in the 1860s, you know, de jure. We got them in the 1960s. That took 100 years. But that really is a testament to the power that the oligarchy once had. Right? That its, its, um, its remnants uh, had lasted that long and was still influencing the American political uh, that many years after its, its, uh, its, destruct its destruction. Um, the failure of Reconstruction consists in its, in its uh, incomplete flattening of oligarchic ranks. And I would just encourage you to think about racism this way. It really is, um, I would say, it's oligarchic ranking of citizens by one of many possible methods. By one of many possible me methods. Oligarchies, regimes that are oligarchic in nature and uh, are organized by the principle of in inequality of natural inequality. They can choose to rank people in many different ways. Right? And they have. You know? um, in, uh, and, and by ranking people by you know, 
skin color is an arbitrary, it, it's one way of, of doing it. Uh, but it could be based on military rank. It could be based on wealth. It, so, um, or it could be based on tribal affiliation. Okay? Um, and, uh, and what I'm suggesting is that uh, really uh, this, we, we still kind of live with some of the, um, some of the residue and influence of the old oligarchy that's still with us. And, and I think in a way, one way to look at it is that it shows you the fact that we don't remember its source of some of these influences is a testament to the success of the Republicans of Reconstruction. Because it could have been so much worse, right? If the Confederacy had succeeded or if uh, the Republicans had capitulated, right? There, we, you know, I told you that one of the delegates wanted to uh, open the slave trade and fill up the existing limits of the Confederacy with 40 million more slaves. And that also means that non-slaveholders would have been reduced to political vassalage, right? Uh, so they would be, in a sense, political slaves. And that could have happened, affected everybody. We were saved from that. And foundations for civil rights uh, were established. So um, I think, you know, it, it, the results of Reconstruction, they were a mixed bag. Um, and I, I think we should remember the good as well as the bad. So with that, I'll, uh, I'm happy to take some questions. And, I, and ask me tough ones. This is for the camera, so I'm going to ask uh, for me rather than around. Uh, I'm going to, this is the first question. You said something that really caught my attention. Yeah. The grandsons of the founders became oligarchs. Yeah. What happened? Why did how, they? Yeah. I mean, how does that, is it, they lived an oligarchic way of life? Did yeah. They intellectually uh, transformed? Do you have a story to tell about, about that? Yeah, I do. Um, well, the, the why of it, you know, is probably the ultimate answer to that is known only to God. But I can tell you, um, you know, one of the strongest anti-slavery philip, uh, philippics from the, the founding period is by George Mason. Um, and if you've never seen it, you ought to. Uh, it really is a powerful condemnation of slavery. He's a Virginia statesman. He died young, but he was in the founding generation. And he says in this Philippic uh, that if we, here we are building a republic and our future legislators who will be our children um, cannot be brought up amid slavery and, um, and, and, and uh, we can't expect them to remain loyal to republicanism, in other words. I'm, I'm paraphrasing here. He's, his language is very powerful and he says if we don't do it, God is going to punish us through our children and destroy our aspirations of founding a republic and so on through our children. His grandson was James Mason, who was a Republican, or I'm sorry, a senator from the state of Virginia. And in, in 1860, he entered, he, he is when uh, Peter denies Christ after Christ predicts that he's going to deny him. And it struck me in that way when I read it. I thought, my gosh, this is the grandson of the man who said, God is going to punish us through our children by forsaking republicanism. And that's exactly what you see in the pages of the, of the Congressional Globe. So under, how do you think, or do you think that understanding Reconstructionist policies and aims um, and how that took so, even took so long to get to the Civil Rights Act of the 1960s and it's been another 60 years since then, do you think that informs our understanding of how we have the policies, the, the atmosphere today of like addressing disparate impacts um, and remedial policies and things like that? Yeah. Um, 
Well, that's, you asked to ask me a small question. <laughs> that's a big, uh, huge, huge uh, invites. Uh, uh, I mean, you could have a course uh, devoted to trying to answer that. Um, um, but it's a very good question. And, you know, I would say this, that um, I think our country would be in a lot better position if we understood this history better. Um, and especially if we understand, you know, let me take you all back to dividing this room up the way that I did. Imagine you're in this group, right? And when you are, you're looking for work, and the slaveholders who are here, they're not hiring them because they have slaves. So they don't get wages, which means they're poor, which means when new land comes available, they don't have, they can't, they don't have the wages to be able to buy that land, so they get it. So they get richer and they get more land and they become filthy rich, they do. And their profits are reinvested in more slaves and more land and they get poor. And when they have back-breaking work that they want done, then they might hire these people because they don't want to hurt their capital, that is their slaves. And so if there's, you know, very dangerous work to be done. I mean, this I've come across examples like this in the historical record. What I'm trying to do is explain to you where their resentment comes from. They saw both slaves and masters as coordinate pieces of a machinery that crushed them, that stole their American liberty from them, and they saw them importing foreigners. The way they saw them was they were importing <laughs> foreigners and preferring those foreigners to citizens of the republic. Try to put yourself in their shoes and you can understand where the resentment comes from and where um, the anger that fuels racism comes from. And then they also could observe that these slave owners were, you know, they, were in, they had imported people who looked very different and so what assumptions could they make that these people who want, who are not seeking equals for fellowship, but are trying to find people whom they could dominate, this, you know, what those observations feed into their misperception of racial inferiority. So you combine those factors, resentment, hatred, being, having their American liberty taken from them, and then the, the uh, harm that they had, in, in, had to endure. And who did they see as culprits? From their point of view, and I, again, I'm, I, I'm not saying I believe any, I'm just saying, I'm trying to help you understand from their point of view, what they see is foreigners who seem to be inferior because they're in inferior positions, right? Um, you can easily then see how racism takes shape and then not only that, but in this political regime, they openly, by practice and then also by their public pronouncement, they repudiate the idea of natural equality. And in a society whose laws are based on the recognition of inequality, rights are determined by rank and that determined by wealth. And there's recent research that has come out that has shown that in the county court system of these southern states, um, the disposition of justice was accorded according to wealth. Which means that your rights are unstable. If you live in Massachusetts, you knew no matter whether you're rich or poor, your rights were stable and equal to any, anybody else. Your quanta of rights that, uh, you, that were in the law were the same as anybody else. So wealth, greater wealth, it afforded you greater creature comforts and nothing more. Didn't have any effect on your political status. In a slave state where government was like this, your rights, your rights were unstable, which meant this. Economic struggle is not merely a struggle to attain greater creature comforts, economic struggle is a struggle for rights as well and for recognition and status. 
and you could be treated like dirt, no matter, you know, no matter if justice is on your side or not. Right? You could just so, um, and I've found in my research also that murder rates during the antebellum period, they spike the closer you get to the black belts where slavery is more concentrated. What does that mean? That means to me, my interpretation is that it means that this political culture, uh, you know, uh, had where you know where it was most concentrated, is where you find the um, the individual struggle for dominance. Uh, 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 you know, uh, um, you know. Um, it, you know, expressed in this way with, you know, dueling and just wanton murder and all of that. So uh, as soon as you break up that regime, you unleash forces that I've just described that cause all kinds of, and who ends up in the losing end of that. Uh, that's how I understand racism today. I think if more Americans kind of understood the Southern oligarchy and understood we, I mean, we would understand where these forces came from. It would be a whole lot easier for us to kind of get past that. I will also note, just very briefly, you know, Sumner says once in a civil rights debate, he said, look, if you don't vindicate the rights of the emancipated, um, you're going to see this wheel turn against you eventually, right? And, um, you know, he, he was warning against a tribal warfare of identities. Um, and that was his warning, I think, which echoes down, you know, through the ages to our present. I'm sorry, we have about five minutes. Let's try to get uh, I'll be quicker, yeah. sorry. Thank you, Professor. You kind of answered a part of this question already, but I want you to expand on it a little. Uh, obviously, in our current political discourse, there's a lot of talk about a new aristocracy or a new oligarchy. Mm -hmm. If this new oligarchy does exist, is it at all similar to the old oligarchy of the, of the South? And is the solution more republicanism? Well, I don't want to spill the beans on my third book. Uh, <laughs> and, but I would say this, that, you know, um, you know, it, you, it, oligarchy, oligarchy, I mean, Aristotle says, and I, I think the more I study actual regimes and the American regime through time, the more I, I agree with him. You know, there are, you can observe similar patterns. Oligarchic regimes, um, you know, they, actual regimes come in many shapes and sizes, but there are certain fundamental characteristics that they share. And I would say, uh, that in our present day, um, I do see some of those attributes um, featured in American politics today and American government today and within our people, right? Um, and uh, haughtiness, that's one. The presumption that some of us know better and this undermines the whole idea of self-government. Um, the sort of, uh, the, the violation of federalism, I mean, we, you know, national government now just really just pays lip service to true federalism. And, uh, you know, I, the, the, the new opinion that justifies that is that, um, you know, experts know better than, you know, the people out there in the hinterlands, and so we ought to let them, let those in the imperial center decide for us. Now, in Alaska, we get real testy about that. Because uh, when we're trying to build an 11-mile road from, um, you know, from, from one section of the uh, Alaska chain to another to get people who live there for medical care, you know, airport and then into medical care. And somebody in an office building 4,000 miles away says, oh, you can't do that. You're going to hurt the birds and to build that 11-mile gravel road. Well, you look on the Isenbeck National Wilderness, the federal government's website for the Isenbeck National Wilderness area, 
And on that website, it advertises how there are you know, 50 different specimens of birds that you can come hunt. Right? But we can't build a, a one-lane gravel road to help people get from, because they know better than we do. Right? And Madison talks about this. He says, princes are blind. Right? This is why, you know, why Republican government is better. They can't see everything, but they think they know everything. Haughtiness. Right? And I worry about that. Um, and I do think we are succumbing to a kind of you know, oligarchic temptation today. I know there are a lot of questions out there, uh, but I don't want to keep you up. So I'm going to invite all those who have questions just to come on up. Um, enjoy your break. Come back safely. And please join me in uh, thanking Professor Daniel. Get your microphone off and then we'll get those.